Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We have spent a great deal of time speaking about judgment. Over and over, God's prophecy that he gave to Isaiah, that we have been reading and studying together, we have seen and will continue to see much about God's judgment. And we know that prophetically, God's judgment in the last days will bring about vindication and victory, deliverance for Israel. So judgment can be a good thing. In the book of Revelation, we find that God's judgment, his wrath, manifests his glory, his righteousness, and the heavens praise God for this judgment. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 18. The book of Isaiah in chapter 18. Now, this chapter, if you check out various commentators, they will tell you that this chapter is difficult to understand, that it's kind of obscure in in understanding its meaning and its, its content. And for the most part, that's true. Just as a side note, usually I I record the teaching for our study of Isaiah on Mondays. But today, when I'm recording it, it's Friday. And the reason for the delay was simply this chapter required much more prayer, much more study in order to be ready to share what the Lord has placed upon my heart. Now, chapter 18, we're going to see that there's a biblical word here, the word kush. In modern Hebrew, we would be told that this word kush is Ethiopia. I have no problem with that, but probably from a biblical standpoint, the term kush doesn't mean Ethiopia, but, but a greater portion of land perhaps also including Sudan and and other lands around Ethiopia, Eritrea, for example, in the north. We find that Ethiopia, today many people speak about the fact that many Jewish individuals that were in Ethiopia have come to the land of Israel. You visit, you take a tour of Israel, And you're going to see many Ethiopian Jews who have have returned prophetically to the land. And there's more yet to come. There's still many Jewish exiles in Ethiopia. When you go to Ethiopia, and we've been there several times, you'll find that the language of Ethiopia, about 20% of its words are Hebrew words. So there's a close relationship, not only between language, but some of the cultural aspects between Israel and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of the primary nations in Africa. It is a key place. But as we read in this 18th chapter of Isaiah, we're going to find that Ethiopia may not be at the heart of this prophecy. Because it speaks about, and we'll come to this in a moment, the lands beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And if you do a good study of of geography and Ethiopia, you will find that there are nine primary rivers to this moderate nation. And also we have the Blue Nile, a, a sister of the Nile, and a few other rivers that are very large. I believe the two of the top 10 rivers in in Africa are found in 
Ethiopia. So this is geographically correct, historically correct, and it paints a picture for us for the future. So with that said, let's take out our Bibles and look together to the book of Isaiah and chapter 18. It begins with the word hoy. Normally, this word speaks of a woe, something negative that's going to happen. Now, we've spoken about the word Messiah, which is burden, a burden place, as we saw upon Moab and other nations earlier on. And this is a word that introduces judgment. So notice what it says in verse 1. Woe, land of Tzitzel. Now, some Bibles will, will translate this word as shadow because the word tzel is shadow in Hebrew. This is a, a verbal form, so perhaps the shadowing. But there's also a word that's, that's more precise. The root here, four letters. And if I say the term letzatzel, which is rooted here, it's a word for, in modern Hebrew, for a telephone ringing. It is a noise that captures attention. So when we look here, it may not be anything to do with a shadow. I would argue it speaks about the noise, and this is, is supported in the next word, which is the word wings, like wings of a bird or perhaps insects. Many commentators point out because of the rivers, this area of Africa had many insects, many locusts, plagues and such. They were familiar with grasshoppers and locusts and flies and other insects. And this is what it's a reference to. So he speaks, woe, a term of judgment upon the land that, that rings with wings which is may ever lay nare kush, which means which is beyond the rivers of Cush, the rivers of Ethiopia. Now, some would say that it includes Ethiopia, but even beyond. That this judgment goes beyond just one people, but incorporates several different people. And we know if you go to Ethiopia today, you'll know that that land, that region, is made up of different tribes. In fact, one of the concerns today, politically, are the conflicts that are taking place in this area, in Ethiopia precisely, between various tribes. So what this may be referring to is simply a region, these different tribes that dwell in this part of, of the region of Africa. Look now to verse 2. Historically, this area represented a powerful people. At times, these different tribes were brought under the leadership of one ruler, one king. And because of that, they, they pose a great threat. And notice what it says in verse 2. The one that sends in the sea ambassadors, these are are individuals that are sent forth for political purposes to make announcements, to make decrees, to give information from the, the king, the leadership of a country. And in all uh, vessels of, now this can be reeds, papyrus, it speaks about a wood that, that easily floats. So these emissaries, these uh, apostles, ambassadors, messengers, they are going forth out of, out of this region in order to make a proclamation. And notice what it says here. Keep reading the second part of verse 2. Go, kings, or excuse me, it's the term for messengers. It's a different one. Early on we had the word serim, which is, a, a messenger, a ambassador, an emissary. And now we have the word malachim, which is related to a angel or a messenger. Here in this context, it's obviously speaking about a messenger. These two words are parallel. 
And we can see that from context and meaning, that there is going forth people with a message. They are ambassadors, diplomats, or here they are messengers. And then the next word speaks about how they travel swiftly, their light upon the feet. And where are they going? They are going to, and notice what it says, Goy. Now, the term Goy means a people, a nation. Oftentimes, we, we think of that, the word Gentile, but we need to be careful because this word Goy also is used in the Abrahamic covenant, that Abraham would become a Goy, Gadol, a great nation or a great people. And I've shared with you prophetically, in the last days, Israel is called a Goy, and that may be surprising to some when they don't understand the true origin of this word. They think it simply means a Gentile or a pagan, but the term Goy, when it's applied prophetically to Israel in the last days, speaks about a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise that Israel is going to be a great nation and a blessing. So look carefully at this, this section because this section is going to be repeated at the end of this chapter, at the second part of verse 7. So whenever anything is repeated, it's to show an emphasis and importance. Once more, verse 2, we'll read the whole verse. The one who sends out in the sea ambassadors in, in vessels of, of papyrus upon the, the face of the waters. Go, O messengers, or swift messengers, to, and here we have it, Goy, a nation. And notice what it says about this nation, Me Mushach. Now, this is one that can mean lengthen. I believe many translations translate it as tall. I would argue with that. It speaks about something being lengthened, being drawn, that what was drawn. And then the next word, meforat. Again, some would translate it smooth, as in smooth skin. But meforat has to do with, with something being detailed, a, a specific. And I believe when it speaks about Memushach, one that was drawn, it speaks about a calling. Meforat has to do with being unique, different. So it speaks about a nation that was called, that was drawn, drawn to a purpose, and that purpose was to be different, to be set apart, to be unique for God. And then it says, Nora men hu vahala. It was, this people was, were awesome or fearful, not being afraid, but, but rather causing fear from, from now until further, meaning they have a history. And what this is referring to is really the, the anointing that God has placed upon the people of Israel and that has caused the nations to be jealous and want to persecute and destroy. And the fact that the nation survives and, and continues and maintains itself and remains its unique, that special, specific, detailed, all of this was problematic to the world. They wanted to stop this people. They didn't want it to have a history. They didn't want it to be a unique people. But despite all the persecution, it survives. And it says it becomes a goy, once more, kav, kav. Kav is a line, a measuring line. And most scholars tell us when this term kav, kav, and we're going to, to encounter this term several times later on in the prophecy. And that's why it's so helpful to read all of, of a prophecy, studying it in its original language before going back and beginning a study of it, which you share. So having done that, this word kav kav speaks about something that is measured or we could understand it as one that is organized, 
detailed in the sense that it's been measured out. It is one that is, in Hebrew, we would use the term mesudar or organize, meaning that it's been put into place. And because of that, notice the next word, u mebusa, it has to do with one that, that brings defeat. I believe many Bibles translate it that treads down, that defeats its opponents. And it says, who, they, this, this nation, they plunder, and then you have rivers. Now, some of the rabbinical scholars speak about rivers as uh, the opponents. Rivers usually give to a nation power. Even to this day, we know some of the greatest cities, both presently and in the past, are along rivers. It allows them to, to transport things. The river serves as a resource from many different perspectives. So rivers speak about often a strong people. And what it's saying is that this nation, Israel, that was called, that was called to be unique, different, one that became organized by God and was able to defeat other nations and was able to plunder rivers, meaning able to defeat stronger people in their their land it says here read carefully it says a nation that is organized and defeats who plunders rivers of its land meaning those nations that came against its land it defeated them and the reason why i translate it this way is because as we go forward in this chapter and we see the conclusion and that this is repeated verbatimly in verse 7, because of that, that gives us insight on the right understanding for it when we come across it the first time. Let's move now to, to verse 3. All of the dwellers or inhabitants of the world. Now, there's two words for world. Olam, the common word, but oftentimes we see biblically the word tevel, which is the world and even beyond. It is a, a greater word for world. So, verse 3, all the dwellers of the world, the inhabitants of the earth, when a banner is lifted up, and it says the banner of mountains they will see or the mountains will see mountains speak about governments so when this banner is lifted up the governments will see this it is going to be something that captures the attention of all nations all people the second part and when the shofar sounds they will hear and this word here demands a response, a specific response. So notice how in verse 3, the emphasis is on a banner being lifted up, and this in Isaiah's prophecy relates to frequently Messiah. He's this nest that is proclaimed, that is lifted up, that relates to victory. And then the word shofar that ram's horn, which is again uniquely related to Israel, it is going to sound. So when the shofar, that ram's horn sounds, they're going to hear. So it foreshadows a change that is coming into the world. Verse 4, for thus said the Lord unto me. Now Isaiah the prophet is receiving specific personal revelation that he's sharing concerning this event and what God had told him. God says, I will be quiet, but I will look from my habitation. So God is not going to immediately respond. This prophecy of this people it is for the future. It's not for Isaiah's day. God is not going to immediately respond. He'll look at this, he'll notice this, but he is not going to act. But he says, as the heat of, of brightness or clarity, it's the word tzach, 
Sach means pure. So oftentimes when you have a very, very hot day, we find that heat burns up the clouds. So it's a very clear and bright day. And it's saying God's perspective is, is, is perfect. He sees things. In the same way, it speaks about the, the cloud of dew in the heat of the harvest. Now, people are going out to harvest in the morning, and there's the cloud of dew. This was seen as a good thing. So God is patient. He's not responding, but he's waiting. He sees everything. Everything's very clear to him. And at the right time, at the time of the harvest, there's going to be something which is positive, something which is desirable. That's what he's communicating here. Verse 5. For before the harvest. Now, this is something that takes place before the harvest. And this is an image of repentance. Something that waits for a change, but if there's no change, that which did not change is going to be judged and removed. Look carefully. For before the harvest, at the end of the flower, now this is the blossoming. We know that, that produce goes through a process. It sows, it comes up, and then usually there's a blossom. And then that fruit comes and it takes a period of time before it ripens and then is ready for the harvest. So there's an, expect, an inspection. There's an inspection at the time of the harvest to see what is good and worthy to take and what should be removed and tossed aside. And when we study here, it says, before the harvest, at the end of the blossoming, at the time of what? When the, the sour grape, this is the one that has not uh, matured, when it will be ripe. So it's a time, the time that this sour grape should be ripe, that there should be a flower. At that time, what does it say? Well, look carefully. It says that the shoots, and the implication is, the ones that did not produce good fruit, they're going to be cut. And they're going to be cut with the pruning hooks or pruning shears. And also the nitishot, these are the things that were not harvested. They looked, they were observed, they were evaluated, inspected, and they were, were not taken. They will be removed, and again, they are going to be cut off. So there's a termination. There's an inspection, and that which is not fruitful, pleasing to the ones who harvest, it is going to become a source of or a recipient of judgment. Verse 6, they will be left. These shoots, these things that did not produce pleasing fruit to God, it says they are going to be left together for the, the fowl. This is a, a bird a bird of the mountains, and for the beasts of the earth, and they are going to be for sustenance for him in the summer, for that uh, bird of prey, and for every beast of the field for him in the winter. So what this is to tell us is that this uh, harvest, there was very few that was received. The vast majority was, was cast aside. It was left for the rest of the summer and even on into the winter that the beasts of the earth, the, the fowl of the mountains, those birds that fly up in the sky along the mountains, they're going to eat them. They're going to be nourished about them. And this is an idiom for judgment. What the birds of the heavens eat and feast upon, biblically. We see that in the account of, of David and Goliath. We see it in other places in the scripture. That which the birds of the heavens, the sky, feeds upon, or what the beasts of the earth eat, this is an idiom of judgment. 
Now let's move to our final verse, verse 7. At that time. Now most scholars, and here again, don't take my word. Look and do your own research and study. But we see a sharp contrast between chapter 18, verse 1, and chapter 18 and verse 7. When you know the language, things stand out. And there's a great difference between the word hoy, meaning how awful, how bad something's going to be, and the word or the phrase ba'et hahi, usually in the scripture. Ba'et hahi speaks about a good time, a time where the things of God, his purposes, will be fulfilled. So when we look at verse 7 of chapter 18, there is a change. What is that change? At that time, a gift, and this is the word shy, a unique word for, for gift in the scripture. People know it. People are called by that, that word as a name today in Israel. But shy is also a messianic word. We see that, for example, in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10. So this gives it a messianic context now, the days of Messiah, not his first coming, but his second one. So in that time, meaning at the last time, in the Yomot HaMashiach, the days of Messiah, it says a gift will be brought to the Lord of hosts. So instead of persecuting and attempting to thwart the things of God, this judgment is going to bring about a change. Judgment is going to bring about obedience for the remnant of the nations. They're going to respond by worshiping. Bringing a gift to God is worship once more. At that time, a gift will be brought to the Lord of hosts. And then notice what we see. We see that same phrase in verse 2, which speaks about, and I believe, as many do, it's a reference to Israel. A gift is going to be brought to the Lord God of hosts. And what is that? The Jewish people, those final exiles, those ones that were left. And this, this relates to Matthew 24 and verse 31 where God says he will send out his angels and they are going to gather up the elect from the four quarters of the world. Now, when you hear this word four corners, it doesn't mean that the earth is flat. It's speaking about four directions. The term pina, oftentimes translated corner, but it simply means different sides. So north, south, east, west. It's an inclusive. Four is a global number. So when it says the four, four ends of the earth, the four corners. It's just speaking about a global context. So they are going to bring a gift to the Lord of hosts. And what's that gift? This people, a people that had been dragged, that is called, one that is unique, specific, detailed, a people. Who is And the word I translated earlier, Nora, can mean a people that causes fear, can be also the term an awesome people. From that time, meaning from now and from ongoing, a nation that is organized and is defeating, meaning it's victorious, it brings defeat. And what do we learn from that? Well, it is a powerful nation with God to bring either blessing or curse. And what is done with Israel is going to determine, and when I say Israel, obviously, we're speaking about the one who comes from Israel, the Messiah. He is going to bring subjection into the world. That is, people are going to be subjected to him. So that term speaks of victory. Look again, to an organized and and defeating or victorious people, they're going to bring defeat to others. They are going to plunder the rivers of its land, meaning those strong ones that came to its land, it is going to plunder them. And then how do we know that? 
Notice the last part. To a place. What place? The name of the Lord of hosts to Mount Zion. So what it's speaking about here is that there's going to be a victory through God's judgment. The nation of Israel is going to be seen, rightly so, in that time as an awesome nation. A nation that defeats the enemy, those things that are opposed to God, and brings victory and blessing throughout his creation. And that's all key. Where is the center of that? Well, notice what the scripture says. The name of the Lord of hosts, Har Sion, Mount Zion. And when people, and more and more, and I'm going to close with this, more and more people are, are hostile to Zion. When someone is hostile to Zion, realize they are someone who stands in opposition to the plans, the purpose, the establishment of the kingdom of God. When someone is anti-Zionistic, that one is identifying themselves as a follower of the Antichrist. So let's just be very, very clear about this. Someone who believes Zion is a bad term, you know what they normally subject or substitute Zion with? Palestine. When someone chooses Palestine rather than Zion, this is someone who says, I don't want a biblical kingdom of God. I want things according to the ways of the world. And more and more, I'm seeing individuals that, and I listen to a lot of biblical teachers and there's one and I'm just going to name him this time because I feel he's one of the most dangerous teachers I won't say Bible teachers because he's not but Andy Stanley he is a very dangerous individual he is a false teacher he is someone that does not respect the Word of God properly he is someone that wants to to disconnect the Old Testament from the New Testament. Someone that is leading people astray. And if you were to listen to him, when he used to substitute at times for his father, watching it on in touch, you would say that he would say the word Israel. But recently, I see him choosing the term Palestine. And this shows a change. A change of turning away from recognizing the authority of the Word of God and choosing to use terms that are politically correct. We ought not do that. We need to be people that realize that true faith is rooted in the Bible. And the same faith that, that one has as a small child, you know, the Bible speaks about a childlike faith. And when you respect, as a child does, the Word of God, and you bring that into your adulthood, and you approach it as the Word of God, and you study it, you find that these things which, and when someone says, when religious uh, uh, theology differs with the science, well, we, we've got to know, we've got to go with what's undeniable. That is false. We see over and over historically, how science is catching up to the Word of God. Now, the Bible is not for, for someone who wants to allow science to be his rule and his measure of interpreting the Scripture. We need to allow the Word of God to be the, the foundation of everything that we believe. We're not afraid of science. But more and more science is confirming what the Word of God said so many decades, hundreds, over almost 2,000 years ago, the New Testament, and over 2,400 years ago, the, the last book in the Old Testament, 2,400 years ago. So we see that it has stood the test of time. And when someone says there's a disagreement, it's because 
they superficially look at the word of God. And one of the ways that we can tell someone who superficially looks and study God's word is when they use a very wretched translation, and that's the New International Version. It is not a translation that is reliable at all. And when there's a Bible teacher that uses that, my experience has been stay away from that one. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.